Okay, now let's look at verse 9. But now, so back, verse 8, you are this, right? Now you're this one right here. But now, after that ye have known God, so now you know God, not these gods, which are not even gods at all. After that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. So notice right here, not only did you know God, this is going to be powerful, God even knows you. So he knows you personally. So that's why it makes sense right here that Calvinism is bunk. You might say, what is Calvinism? Calvinism, what it means is it means bunk. That's what it means. But anyway, what Calvinism means, uh, why do you say that, preacher? Because Calvinism has been a system that corrupted many different churches. A lot of their uh, teachers and preachers are wannabe scholars. They try to act like that they know a lot and they're prestigious and they graduated from schools and universities. But to be quite honest, those schools and seminaries they go to, they're not really prestigious. I could go over there and apply if I wanted to real easily. So it's not a prestigious university. So these guys are just wannabe scholars. And what they do is that they're so prideful that they pick on other Christians they disagree with and make them look dumb. Make them look unintellectual. And that really ticks me off. You got to realize this. Everyone is a soul. That doesn't make you better than them. Amen, what makes me very mad, and that's why I slam some of these Calvinists very hard. What makes me slam them very hard is that I hate it when they have this kind of bully attitude where they belittle, down, belittle other people who have an honest love for Jesus Christ and right doctrine. So I rub dirt on them in return. This is not to say all Calvinists are prideful and arrogant. A lot of them, they just go by tradition or denomination. But if you look at their leaders or their preachers, very prideful, arrogant people. They're climbing up the ladder on YouTube very immensely. So if you see this on YouTube, I want you to unsubscribe from them and leave them. You're just feeding their ego. John MacArthur, Todd Friel from the Wretched Channel, Paul Washer, Ray Comfort is not a Calvinist, but he's getting influenced a lot by them. And leave those guys, leave John Piper, his channel is called Desiring God. So I want you all to look up your subscription right now, those of you who are watching online. If you see that, unsubscribe from them. And I seriously mean that. If you see Alpha and Omega Ministries by James White, do a double unsubscription from that. And don't even watch his videos because you'll just build up his views. If you see a video channel, by Jeff Durbin, then what you need to do is you need to leave that channel. It's called Apologia Studios. So I don't know if I pronounce that right in Greek anyways. So I think it means Apologize Studios. That's what it means. But anyway, so those guys, unsubscribe from them. They're very arrogant, prideful, and they're picking up a lot of recognition online now. I notice that. They're going to be bigger. They're already overwhelming us now. Uh, if you type down a Bible question, it is Calvinist websites that you'll find. CARM.net or .com uh, by Matt Slick. And that guy is the slickest guy ever when you hear him debate. It is plain rude. You, I don't even want to talk about that guy. He is plain rude. The other one it looks like a more nice guy. I forgot. Uh, GotQuestions.org or something like that. I think that's his website. But he's a four-point Calvinist. So you see, Calvinists are dominating all over. These guys have more than 200,000 subscribers, you got to understand. They're, gonna do they're dominating the internet now. If you look at your subscription list, if you see that, please unsubscribe from them. All right? All right, I went off a long time on Calvinists on that. So Calvinists, what is their problem? Their problem is that they think that, okay, God picks and chooses long before the foundation of the world, ever since the beginning. And ever since the beginning, he knew which ones would be his elect, and he chose those to be his elect. When? Long before the beginning. Okay, then you use Galatians, that verse. God didn't even know you until you got saved, Amen. not before the beginning of the world. So that's where you get them on. When did he know you? He know you when you reached here, this status, not before. But Calvinists, they teach long before the beginning of the world, he knew you and he chose you to be his uh, elect. Fooey. That is fooey. So look at those guys who have THDs and DDs and XYZs. And these people who claim to know Greek and Hebrew when they actually don't, they're really amateurs. But when you look at these guys, look at how they... Um, 
Look at how they don't even know a single basic verse at Galatians. Calvinism is a very complicated doctrine. You can go semantics, theological concepts, and philosophical sayings with that one, philosophical terms. So they spend so much time, you know, trying to figure out 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3 in 20 different ways when all you have to do is just flow through it one time and find out, look, they were even wrong. So no matter how many semantics or ways you go around it, they're still wrong when you look at the simple basics of it. Okay, anyways, uh, just in case some people criticize me that I don't know what I'm talking about, you can just watch my Calvinist videos. And I do it in plain, easy language where I play their playground in the complications, all the roads and the terms and the concepts. And you know what I did? I just pointed out why it's more simplistic than you think, why they're definitely wrong. So if you want to critique me on that one, then you can just simply watch my videos on that or you can talk to me after church. I'll be more than happy to talk to you about it out of respect and kindness, okay? I'm only mean when it comes to those kind of scholars who belittle people. Amen. Okay, so let's look at the main text here, okay? I went on enough on Calvinist. Verse 9. So the second part, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? So Paul's saying at the beginning of verse 9, once you know God and God knows you, why are you going back to the weak and beggarly elements that you did? Now remember, so we know right here that at the previous verse, this is what he's talking about right here. The weak and beggarly elements are referring to this when they were Gentiles, worshiping gods which by nature are no gods. But if you, not only the previous verse, but look at all the five verses behind it or the chapters behind it. Remember the illustration he talked about elements and bondage at chapter 4, verses 1 through 5? He was speaking about the Old Testament law here, right? So the weak and beggarly elements are not just this. It's also referring to this as well, the Old Testament law. Why? Because both of them share a common thing you got to realize. Notice that both the Gentile way of worship and the Jewish way of worship it's all legalism. See, they have a day system, a ritual system, uh, all these kind of ordinances, it's traditions, etc. So notice that they're all similar. The similarity here is law. The similarity here is legalism. That's the key. So throughout the entire theme of Galatians, what you want to keep in mind, what Paul was strong against was legalism. That's why Jesus Christ, he preached very hard against Pharisees and Sadducees, religious leaders. Why? Because he hated legalism. He hated how they were always prone to hardcore law, law, law. As a matter of fact, just getting back to our Calvinist friends over here, just because I don't want to leave them alone, John Calvin was very bad at that too. He lived, his dominion was, theoc uh, was trying to go by theocracy. He imprisoned you just because if your haircut was wrong. I kid you not. He even burned a saved brother in Christ at the stake. You see, the not, not so Christian after all, right? So anyways, as we return to our main text right here, we can see how much the Bible hates legalism. They hate that to a T. All right, let's keep reading right here. The second part of verse 9, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Remember, see that? This, all this legalism stuff is bondage. Weak, beggarly elements, bondage. Uh, let me know if I'm out of bounds on this side right here. I hope he got all the words right there. But anyways, so we see right here that Paul, he hates that. So in verse 10, this is a good verse to mark down. Ye observe days and months and times and years. Notice that, see, in the New Testament Christianity, days, times, month, years don't matter to God. So there are some people who claim that you have to keep observing the Sabbath. There are people who make a big deal, and then, you know, the Catholic Church, they have all this ritualistic stuff during the Easter Bunny hol holiday, and maybe some of their kids will have Easter Bunny ears on, and then... They'll have Christmas where they'll have all this ritualistic, you have to have a tree. You just have to have a tree even if you pay a lot of money on that one. A huge tree if you got a huge church building. So you got to pay a couple hundred dollars on that one. Then you have to go by all this ritualistic pattern. 
But the Bible says that those days don't matter. This even includes some people who make a big deal about, oh, Christmas is pagan. Oh, you know, they even go as far as to say Thanksgiving is pagan. And then they'll talk about the history about the pilgrims turning against the Indians and that it was not about thanking God and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you go, I even heard Mother's Day is paganism, okay? So they go as far as to do that. But notice in that verse, verse 10, don't observe days, months, times, and years. Who cares? See? The point is when you live the days to God, right? And Romans 14 is the best chapter on that one. So if you look at Romans 14, it doesn't matter to God what days you observe. So it's ritualistic, verse 10, days, months, and times, and years. So if Seventh-day Adventists try to get on you that you got to observe the Sabbath, you got to observe the Sabbath, you got to observe the Sabbath, you pull up Galatians 6, 10, uh, 4, 10. Tell them, no, it doesn't matter which day to God. Okay, verse 11. I am afraid of you. So Paul is afraid for those people. Why? Lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul is afraid that everything that he worked hard for them to understand that, hey, it's not about works, legalism for salvation. It's about what? Faith and grace in Jesus Christ. Remember that? That was the key theme. It was faith in Jesus Christ. That was the main highlight. But Paul is so worried that all of his labor that he tried to preach this would be in vain. And notice that fear was carried in the previous chapters too, which we looked at before. Chapter 3, for example, chapter 3 and verse 4. See, if it be yet in vain. Look at chapter 2, verse 2. Paul had to go secretly to the apostles because why? He was afraid his ministry would be in vain. See, he couldn't do it as boldly and publicly as he wanted to. So notice right here, Paul, he had a fear inside that they would uh, reject this salvation by faith. His labor was all for nothing. Okay, look back at verse 12, chapter 4, verse 12. Brethren, I beseech you. So Paul calls these Galatians his brethren, and he's beseeching, he's begging them. Be as I am. So Paul's saying, I want you to be like me, for I am as ye are. So Paul's saying, I'm even like you guys. Okay, so what does that mean, Pastor? What that means is this. So the Galatians, they were Gentiles, right? See all this? These guys were Gentiles back then. They were not like this blue marker here, right? They were bound to the rules, regulations of the Old Testament law here. So these are Jews. So Paul was saying right here that I want you to be like me. Why? His stance is against legalism, right? The Old Testament law. We saw that all over the chapter Galatians. There was no doubt about that. Paul was saying, look, I'm free. I'm free. Say by faith. Say by grace. The Old Testament law is not needed. It is abolished by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We went through so many times on that in those verses in Galatians. So Paul is saying, I want you to be exactly like me, just like I was like you. What did he mean by that? Just like them, because these Gentiles did, were not Jews. They were not Jews to begin with. They didn't observe all these Jewish ordinances and rituals like uh, in the Old Testament law way. So Paul is telling them, so just like I was like you without the uh, Old Testament law in Judaism, then be like me, where I'm without the Old Testament law in Judaism. That's what he's pointing out right there. Because it's very funny, these Galatians, they did not have Judaism back then. Now all of a sudden, these Judaizers, whoever these guys are, start to sneak in and say, hey, you got to get circumcised. Hey, you got to follow the law of Moses. Hey, you got to do this and this and this. Observe the Sabbath and then observe the dietary laws, Levitical dietary laws, etc. And Paul's like, why would you get into that when before you weren't like that? Okay, so let's go back here. Ye have not injured me at all. So Paul's saying that whatever they're doing to themselves, it doesn't injure him. He's only looking out for them. They're just injuring themselves when they're doing all this. It's not injuring him, but those guys are injuring themselves. Let's look at verse 13. You know how, how through infirmity of the flesh. So Paul's saying, you do know the kind of infirmity that I went through in my body. Okay, infirmity throughout the Bible is sickness or weakness. 
So Paul had something in his body that was sick or weak. I preach the gospel unto you at the first. So Paul's saying right here, when he preached the gospel to them on how to get saved, notice at the first. So at the beginning, Paul preached to them the gospel with this infirmity, this sickness in his flesh. You might go, what kind of sickness did he have back then, pastor? So when Paul, so all of this stuff, all this caboodle that I drew just now, all of this right here, da, 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 Paul preached about it. <laughs> but how did he preach all this when he had his sickness, infirmity, in the flesh? So let me know if I'm out of bounds on this side. So then this infirmity in the flesh right here, you'll notice that he had this sickness or this disease or this illness in his health while he preached all of that. That's quite a lot of power the Lord mightily used him on, despite of his sickness. So what is that sickness? Let's keep reading here. Verse 14, and my temptation, which was in my flesh. So Paul says that this sickness in his flesh is called temptation. Ah, then this is important to understand. Look at James chapter 1, please. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. A lot of people think that when God tempted Abraham, that means God made Abraham sin. No. If you look at James chapter 1, when the Bible says you endure through temptations, it does not mean going through the kind of seductions that would lead to sin. Temptation or test, it means trial. That's what temptation means. It means trial. How do we know that? Because Galatians is the greatest evidence. He had this trial in his flesh, this test from God in his flesh. Not, uh, if, if this infirmity in his flesh is what? You think it was a temptation to sin? So you think Paul was struggling with porn addiction all this time while he was preaching that. That's what God meant, you know? Well, with this porn addiction all my life, you know, then I preached all of this. No, that's not what it means right here. It means, obviously, that there's some kind of trial or problem in his flesh. So that's what temptation means. It means trials, hurdles, problems. That's the idea. So look at James chapter 1. Some people think that this crown of life has to do with enduring through sinful temptations, you know, resisting the urge to sin. But that's not what it means. That one would be more properly 1 Corinthians 9, actually, the, the incorruptible crown. This... Now, James chapter 1, it can include, I mean, you can include sinful addictions or the things that you're struggling with because that is part of a trial. That is part of a problem. You can include that, but it's not solely that. It just means what it says, any kind of problem you go through. So if God gives you a problem or trial in your life, if you endured through that yet came to church today, you should actually rejoice because you're going to get the crown of life. So that should be encouraging to you, actually. James chapter 1, we will read verse 3. Uh, verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers, what? Temptations. What is this temptation? Verse 3, knowing this, that the what? Trying of your faith worketh patience. See that? So that has to do with trials. Now let's keep reading right here. Look at verse, uh, is it 4, brother? No, it's not 4. Uh, wow, I just lost it right here. Uh, 12, verse 12. Thank you. Okay. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. See, if you endure, so endure sounds like you're overcoming a problem, pain, see? So it doesn't sound like a sinful urge. Endureth temptation for when he is what? Tried. So there's your getaway card. So this temptation has to do with trying, testing doesn't have to do with sin. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. So that's how you get the crown of life. So when the Bible says God tempted Abraham at Genesis 22, that's a favorite passage that atheists would like to use that, oh, so there's a contradiction in your Bible. God tempted Abraham, Genesis chapter 22. But here at James chapter 1, notice in verse 13, no one is tempted of God. God doesn't tempt you to sin. So there's a contradiction right there. No, because silly, if you, if you just 
instead stop focusing at verse 13 through 15, but rather read verses 3 through 12, you would notice that James is talking about there's a trying temptation right here, which differs from a sinful struggle temptation. So Abraham, when God tempted Abraham, he was testing his faith, trying his faith. He was not saying, hey, Abraham, I want you to sin. That's not God. 